How to avoid eye complications with botulinum toxin. If you're gonna be helping patients look younger and therefore be more empowered to have longer, healthier lives, botulinum toxin will probably be part of it for many of them. We need to make sure that they are protected from the negative side effects. So in this video, I'm gonna teach you how to understand the causes of complications and then avoid them by altering your injection technique. There's lots of 3D anatomy that we're gonna share so that you can really visualize what's actually going on when patients get these side effects. This will also make it much easier for you to change your strategy if you haven't already so that you don't get these side effects in the future. I'm on a mission on this channel to bring you the latest scientific ways to restore a human being. And although we're starting with appearance, we're gonna cover everything from the cell up. So if you're a clinician or a patient who wants to understand more about this so you can do it safely, make sure you subscribe. Let's look at some of the most common complications caused by treating patients around the eye. The most feared of the side effects in the face from botulinum toxin is probably an eyelid droop. And that's because if you get an eyelid droop, it is very upsetting. It's not one of these side effects you can cover with makeup. Patients are disrupted in their daily life. They can even have visual disturbance because the eyelid can be so low that you can't see directly in front of you. And this causes a significant amount of upset for the clinician as well. So we need to learn how to avoid it. And that starts with understanding exactly what's occurring. So let's have a look in a 3D diagram of the anatomy of the eye so you can see where the toxin needs to be in order to cause the side effect so that we can make sure we don't do it. Have a look at this diagram here which we have created. So this diagram shows some important structures that many people do not talk about very much. Right here the semi-translucent area is the orbital membrane and this membrane represents the boundary between the orbit and the rest of the face. Most of the structures that cause side effects we are most concerned about are behind this membrane and this gives you a clue as to how we can avoid getting toxin into this area. Let's break it down and look at the superior muscles of the eye so you can see in what order they may be affected and also how you would therefore not treat the eye in order to reduce the risk of them. Let's have a look at the deepest muscle which is actually attached here to the sclera. So this muscle is the muscle that lifts the actual eye up so it is involved in upward gaze. The superior rectus muscle pulls the eye back and allows you to look towards the sky. On top of that is the next muscle, which is not the levator palpebrae, but looks a bit like it. And it's actually a smooth muscle, which sits between the levator palpebrae muscle and the superior rectus. This muscle is called the tarsal muscle, or sometimes called Muller's muscle. It's smooth muscle, which means it doesn't respond to conscious control. You can't actively say to yourself, I'm going to contract Muller's muscle. But if you're stressed or anxious, have recently been given a big fright, or if you take stimulants, that muscle will become more active and that's why people's eyes widen in certain circumstances. It's also why we can treat this muscle with a sympathomimetic drug that simulates the action of adrenaline on that same muscle. Above that muscle is the one that is most commonly affected and we can see why, because if you have a look at the space here, the first thing that a toxin will come into contact with once passing through the fat will be the levator palpebrae muscle. Let's have a look at the path of this muscle because I really want you to understand where this muscle is. Many injectors understandably assume that injecting the eyelid will cause an eyelid ptosis, but actually injecting the eyelid causes the eyelid to open. It's, you've got to get toxin behind the eyelid in order to actually directly affect the muscle that pulls the eyelid open. Have a look here in this diagram at where this muscle actually resides. It's on top of the superior rectus muscle, but passing all the way back into the globe. Have a look here on the other side, you can see how deep the structure is, it's probably about four to five centimeters before it touches the back of the orbit. And this is really where the toxin needs to get in order to cause the side effect that we're worried about. So what does this tell us about how we need to inject? The first thing is avoiding the eyelid is not really gonna help you avoid eyelid ptosis. It's really about the depth in particular in relationship to the orbital membrane. If you wanted to cause an eyelid ptosis, what would you do? You would stick a needle straight through orbicularis oculi through the orbital membrane into the superior surface above the globe. So any injection that's even rem remotely similar to this will be increasing the chance of causing this problem. So we should think about how to inject in a way that would steer us away from this error. Let's think about what you're normally doing when you inject above the eye. You're treating the corrugator supercilii in most cases, and sometimes the orbicularis oculi. So when injecting these structures, we can change our technique to reduce the risk. Corrugator supercilii needs to be understood by thinking about its origin and insertion. Its origin is on the bone, just above the nasal bone, and its insertion is in the skin, just near the mid-pupillary line. So this tells you about where the muscle runs. Between here and the surface of the skin 
is a relatively straight line and that's where we should be injecting. You should be able to test this with contracting the muscle and then we need to follow the depth of the muscle and this is the bit that clinicians sometimes don't get taught very well is how do you follow the depth of the muscle? It's not simply inject, inject, inject in the same way along the muscle. We need to start deep pointing medial towards the origin of the muscle and that means you've got much higher chance that the toxin will reside within the muscle structure itself. If you have a look at this diagram here which we'll put on the screen you can see how depth affects the ability of the needle to get underneath the corrugated supercilia. The moment the needle tip is under the muscle instead of within the muscle all of the toxin will spread underneath and towards the eye instead of what we really want, which is for it to be in the body of that muscle. So you have immediately got a massively increased risk just by being half a millimeter too deep underneath the corrugator supercilia. So a lot of attention needs to be given to staying in the muscle. One way to do this is to think about the muscle more like a vein that you're trying to cannulate. So when we take blood, if you think about the way you'd approach a vein, you'd be trying to get into the tube and your needle would be parallel with it, pointing in the direction the vein is going. The same can be done with the muscle. If we know the muscle is going from superficial to deep, we can point in that direction with our needle. So needles coming medially towards the origin at a deep injection point, most medial, then intermediate, and then very superficial, will follow the tract of the muscle perfectly and you will massively reduce your risk of islotosis. In summary, if you want to avoid islotosis, follow the track of the muscle. It's deep, medially, superficial, laterally. Point your needle in parallel with the muscle towards the origin and for an extra step in safety, put some orbital rim pressure on while you inject and when you finish, roll away from the eye.